Um, so our, our next speaker is uh, Francesco Rinaldi from the Universidad degli Studi di Padova. And he um, will be uh, speaking about fast flash detection using projection free methods. So uh, before I start, I'd like to thank organizers uh, for the invitation. It's really an honor for me to be here today and uh, have a, to have the chance to give this talk. And today's talk is based on work with Emmanuel Bonds and Damiano Zephyro. And it's mildly related to the research activity we have uh, carrying out in the last couple of years, and it's related to projection free methods. And uh, in particular, today I'm going to show you some recent results uh, connect projection free methods with the uh, cluster detection. So uh, I'm going to start uh, with. Uh, what net science is, and it's, as we all know, it's a field concerned with the study of complex networks. And it uh, rapidly evolved uh, in a few across many domains. And we have uh, these uh, complex networks popping up in uh, many different areas like biology, medicine, neuroscience, and so and um, so what we really need uh, is uh, efficient tools and um, models and uh, tools that allow us to deal with these uh, networks. And um, the question now is how to represent the network? Well, the answer is easy. From a mathematical point of view, we can uh, simply use a graph where the nodes and vertices are the entities in our networks and the, the links or the edges are the connection, the relationship that we have uh, between uh, uh, two entities. And of course, um, the nice part is that many fundamental network science tasks can be actually seen as a challenging optimization, optimization problems. And the challenging part comes from uh, their combinatorial flavor. And this makes them hard to be solved. And uh, in particular, the new network networks we are dealing with that are stemming from data science applications, they are um, quite uh, large, uh, so a number of nodes, a number of uh, edges, and, and these uh, actually requires tailored optimization tools and algorithms. And uh, so the main goal uh, is uh, solving larger and more complex problems in, in reasonable time. And um, the way we can a possible way to significant breakthroughs in this uh, area is by bridging continuous and discrete optimization. And uh, researchers in this uh, researchers in this area they have been trying to do this uh, uh, for at least a couple of de decades now. So um, we mainly focus on um, network connectivity issues are related to the presence of so-called mesoscale structure in, in large networks. And the most relevant problem in this context is uh, the so-called cluster detection problem, also known as community detection problem. The reason why we focus on this uh, kind of problem, and the, I mean, and, uh, um, researchers uh, focus on this uh, kind of problem is, that is uh, because uh, uh, it allows us to highlight, as I said, connectivity properties at a, at a scale level, uh, middle uh, scale, I would say, level. It's really crucial from a practical point of view to obtain insights behavior of uh, the processes that take place in the network. So we're basically focusing on the relationship between a large group of uh, nodes inside or um, entities inside the network. Of course, we can define a cluster in a strict sense as a subgroup whose members are all friends to each other. So we have complete modality and from a mathematical point of view corresponds to a click a subset of vertices that are all adhesion to each other. And so we can formally define a click from a mathematical point of view by considering an, an under graph with vertices B and edges D uh, as a, a subset of nodes uh, such that the graph induced by the nodes uh, are, uh, is uh, complete. And so classic maximum click problem that is, can be then defined as the as finding the clicks or maximum cardinality WG in uh, the graph G. And WG is the so-called uh, click number of the graph. Of course, what we can then do is considering uh, like this simple graph in this case and build up the adjacency matrix related to the graph itself. And um, what we can do is building up a quadratic function related uh, to the adjacency matrix. And this basically gives us the chance to 
tribe, the famous, uh, well-known Moskin Strauss uh, formulation. But we want to maximize this guy of uh, the probability simplex. And uh, Moskin and Strauss proved nice relationship between this object and the click number of the graph. And it's um, a very nice result. And what they also proved is that for every maximum click C that we have, the characteristic vector related to the maximum click is a solution of the problem in here. Um, the problem when dealing with the um, Moskin Strauss problem is that we have uh, spurious solutions uh, for the problem itself. Uh, spurious solutions that actually do not correspond to maximum clicks. Uh, actually, what we can say is that there is no, uh, not at all, relationship between the maximum clicks and local maximizers. So we might have uh, local maximizers that are not um, characteristic vectors, maximal clicks, and vice versa. We might have maximal clicks whose characteristic vector is not a local maximizer. And this is the reason why uh, we need to modify the formulation by adding up. Uh, regularization as proposed in the 99 paper by Bombs. In this case, uh, what we have is a one to one correspondence between uh, local maximum and maximal clicks. And it is very nice we can, because then we can uh, uh, really get good maximal clicks by using local solvers. And there is uh, actually, in, uh, if we use the right solver uh, that has some uh, identification properties of the support, then we no need. To run the algorithm until convergence. Once we uh, we find the support, we are done. Of course, so there is still a con with this kind of approaches because uh, what we have here is complete mutuality, and complete mutuality is uh, way too strict. In fact, just uh, imagine a subgraph with all internal edges but one. This is not for model, but it's actually good from a practical point of view. And this is the reason why uh, people propose the alternative, uh, alternative way to describe uh, communities or cluster like uh, in the paper by you and co-authors, and uh, they define the so-called S effective clicks. And a subset of nodes uh, C in an undirected graph is an S effective click if uh, we have at most S links that are missing between the vertices in C. So this condition is best satisfied. Uh, but, uh, by our subset C. And we can then, in this case, define the maximum S defective click problem. That is, uh, find uh, the S defective click with the largest cardinality WSDG in the graph G. And WSDG is the so called uh, click, uh, effective click number of the graph. Uh, so we now have a nice way to relax comple complete mutuality. And this has been successfully used uh, in uh, many contexts. Just to give you an example, uh, example in the analysis of uh, protein interaction networks, it has been used. And what also what, they, what is also nice is that is that we have a continuous and a cubic formulation uh, for the problem. And this was recently proposed by in a paper by Stoskov and co-authors, uh, published on uh, MacProg. And um, but anyway, what we need to remark is that this is just a way to relax complete mutuality. There, there are plenty of alternatives in the literature, and you can just uh, check these two review papers related to um, community detection and cluster detection problems. Uh, so focus on uh, this um, S defective uh, maximum S defective clip problem. And um, we try to adapt the result uh, we have seen before the, to the, uh, for the classic uh, max click problem. Uh, so what we need to do now is uh, getting back to the exam simple example we had before and the graph G. And what we do is building up the so-called complement of the graph G. It is a new graph that, uh, with all the missing edges that we, uh, we need. Um, so um, once we build up this graph, what we can do is uh, considering the adjacency matrix related to this graph and uh, replacing all the ones in the adjacency matrix with the uh, variables y, i, j, a binary variable y, i, j, then it's going to be one if we want to add a fake edge in the, in the graph g that we have. Okay, so uh, this is the reason why we call this uh, new matrix the 
edge matrix. And this is going to be very useful uh, to define our new uh, continuous problem related to the max s defective click uh, problem. And here is uh, our continuous cubic formulation for the maximum mass defective click problem. Actually, this uh, proposed in the Stochkov paper. But before uh, commenting uh, on them, we give some useful definitions. Uh, e bar from now on is the set of uh, missing edges in the graph. Ds of g is uh, basically uh, cardinality constrained on the y variable. And this is a relaxation. Ds prime of g, the relaxation of this constraint. And uh, with a, I, a, y, we indicate uh, the fake, ma fake edge matrix. And PS is uh, the feasible set of uh, the continuous cubic formulation. And with f of g, we, uh, we, FG, we indicate the objective function of this problem. So what we want is, uh, if we take a look at this problem, what we want is to maximize the function. And in this case, it's a cubic function and it is uh, very similar to the one we had before. So we, have, we still have the adjacency matrix related to the graph G. And we add to this adjacency matrix the fake edge matrix AY. And then our feasible point, uh, points uh, XY, uh, they need to belong to this feasible set that is given as a Cartesian product of uh, the probability simplex. Uh, so that we had before, and uh, the relaxed cardinality constraint. What we can, uh, and what actually Storchkov and Kohodos proved uh, for the problem is the result similar to the one we had for the max classic max click problem. And that is uh, that, uh, given a maximum S defective click C, we can uh, uh, build up a point P of this shape, where xc is uh, still uh, the characteristic vector related to the click, and yp is a feasible point for the constraint such that uh, uh, yigp is equal to 1 for all the missing edges um, that we need to build up the click c. Okay. And this is going to be, and uh, this point p is going to be a solution of problem 2. So we have a correspondence between as defective clicks and uh, solutions of the problem we described, the cubic problem we described before. Of course, all the results that we know for the classic uh, max, defect, uh, max uh, click problem uh, can be extended to this uh, formulation. So we have uh, uh, this relationship between uh, the maximum and the uh, as defective click number. We can, of course, extend some nice uh, bounds uh, from theory uh, to the S defective click case. And of course, what we have is the, the same issues that we had in the Moskin Strauss quality formulation. And in particular, we have spurious solutions again. And uh, this is where. Uh, our approach shows up. So first question we want to answer is uh, how to get rid of a spurious solution. And the second uh, one would be how to efficiently find a solution uh, for uh, the maximum as defective click problem. So in order to answer to this first question, what we need to do is uh, defining a regularized continuous formulation in the same vein as uh, Ponce did uh, the classic uh, max click uh, problem. So what we do in this case is, uh, other than adding a regulation term for the x variables, it's, as you can easily see, uh, what we do is adding uh, also a regularized uh, regularization for the y term. And uh, in this case, the beta uh, coefficient related to this regularization term simply needs to be greater than zero. Um, now that we have uh, a regularized formulation um, for um, the problem, uh, of course, we need a tool to solve the problem. And uh, as we will see, what we can do is uh, simply applying a nice Frank Wolf variant to the a nice uh, Frank Wolf variant that exploits the structure of the problem and uh, that has some nice theoretical property. In particular, we will uh, see that this. 
and the framework variant that we propose has finite time support identification. And so that the maximal as defective clicks can be identified long before urgence. So, but uh, now let us focus on the realized continuous formulation. Let us give some um, results related to this um, new function that we propose. So uh, what we have in this case is nice characterization uh, for the local maxima of the function A. In particular, um, what we can prove is that these three statements are equivalent. So P is a local maximizer. P belongs to this set of uh, strict local maximizers. So P is also, uh, this is a first one is equivalent to say that P is a, a strict local maximizer for the HG. Um, and these two are also equivalent to say that uh, P, point like this, uh, when uh, XC characteristic vector and YP uh, uh, point that satisfy the cardinality constraint, and it's such that uh, uh, C is a click for the extended graph that we obtain by including uh the fake edges uh, described by yp what we also have is that the s uh is equal to transpose yp so we basically say what we basically have is that uh, the um, cardinality constraint is active in this case we always add uh, s fake edges uh, to our um, graph in this case um, so uh, this is a nice result, but because we now have a correspondence between uh, local maximizers and uh, effective clicks uh, in uh, our uh, graph, one-to-one -one correspondence. And another nice result that we want to prove is the following one. Then it's a strict complementarity holds uh, for the function HG. And, and what we also have is G is strongly concave in the minimal phase F of P. Uh, so now that we have all these results, we can reach uh, to the algorithmic part. We focus on uh, first order uh, methods for constraint optimization, and we resort to the classic uh, minimization framework. So what we want is to minimize F of X over a feasible set omega, where omega is a convex and compact subset of Rn, and F is a different function with the Lipschitz regular gradient with a constant L. Uh, so the algorithms we consider here are all iterative methods. Of course, they keep uh, visibility and they only use, of course, first order information. And as we will see, all, shared the, uh, all the algorithms share the same basic scheme. And the main difference in the way the search direction uh, is uh, generated at each iteration. So we can uh, give a general scheme, and this is what we do in this slide. Uh, so the first order methods we consider in here, and uh, they all have this shape. We start by choosing a feasible point, and then on each iteration, what we do is checking that uh, some specific condition, optimality condition is satisfied. And if this is the case, we stop. Otherwise, we generate the same direction somehow by exploiting first order information. And uh, once we have this direction, we should have been move along the direction by using a size alpha k in order to generate a new iterate xk plus one that guarantees a sufficient increase of the objective function. So how to get this size? Well, uh, we here propose three different approaches. Um, I mean, three classic um, overview, three classic uh, approaches from the literature. Uh, we might, for example, use Excel line search. Uh, what we do in this case is exactly minimizing uh, the function of uh, um, the descent uh, direction by starting from the point xk. Otherwise, we can use uh, a measure line search. So in this case, what we do is uh, starting from uh, maximum step size uh, and we shrink the step size until a sufficient reduction can be satisfied. Um, in this condition, what we basically want is that the new point guarantees a re uh, sufficient decrease with respect to the model of the function. And uh, finally, what we can uh, use is the Lipschitz constant dependent step size like the one we have in here. 
in a way, uh, what we actually mean in our convergence result, in order to prove our convergence result, is uh, that um, all the sizes, uh, the step size rules we use, satisfy these two general conditions. So, um, what I'm saying here is that you can use any line search. Result and what you need to guarantee anyway is that these two guys are satisfied. The first one basically gives a lower bound on the step size. So alpha k needs to be uh, greater or equal than this alpha k bar and each iteration. And what we also need to have is a sufficient decrease uh, condition uh, like we have seen before. Um, so um, let's switch to the methods we are dealing with. The first one is the Frank Wolf method. And the Frank Wolf, so the Frank Wolf method has the, the same uh, scheme uh, that we have seen uh, before. And what we do now is just uh, describing uh, how to get the, de the descent direction DK. Well, in this case, uh, DK is described the following way is uh, given by SK minus XK. And SK is the solution of this problem in here. Uh, so we are minimizing this scalar product over the original feasible set. And I think about it, this is nothing but uh, uh, this corresponds to minimize uh, uh, linearized uh, linear approximation of the function over the original uh, set omega. Uh, the nice part is that uh, in this case, I mean, the main features of this method are and are the two main reasons why plenty of people are, have been using this uh, method in, to uh, deal with their applications. The first one is that the method is projection free. So in case Omega is a polytope, what you just need is a linear minimization. I mean, in general, what you need is a linear minimization or uh, for dealing with the problem. And the other nice feature is that uh, sparse iterates are generated in each iteration. In fact, if you think about it, what we do is adding one point SK at each iteration to the description of uh, the iterate you have. Of course, these are many applications. Uh, people uh, use the Frank Wolf, the Frank Wolf method to solve max problems, SVM and DNN training uh, problems, minimum the minimum closing bolt problem, traffic assignment problems, abnormal optimization, and so on. And uh, here is a figure where we show how the Frank Wolf method works as an iteration case. So we have our uh, feasible set in gray, have uh, the level lines related to our function f of x. So what we do is uh, linearizing the function at the point xk. Mm, we minimize the linear model so that we get the solution sk. And at uh, this direction, that point from xk points toward the back vertex sk, the descent direction that we use to generate the new iterate. And uh, we generate it by uh, suitably moving along this direction. And uh, the step size we choose uh, needs to guarantee, as I said before, a sufficient decrease of uh, the objective function. Of course, um, we have uh, some problems that derive with the Frank Wolf method. And uh, those problems derive uh, from the fact that those directions that we generate are always directed toward extreme points. So we are basically bounced, we are basically bouncing between uh, the vertices uh, of um, and the feasible set. And so when we are close to an optimum uh, and uh, optimum is on the boundary of the feasible region, the directions that we generated, the method generates, uh, they get more and more strong to the gradient. And uh, this uh, causes the method to slow down uh, in, in, in really get um, bad performance. Uh, and this is the main reason why um, researchers proposed um, to include new directions in both And uh, the first one that um, proposed to include this uh, kind of direction was Wolf uh, in its, uh, its work related to the away step uh, method. Uh, what we do in uh, this case 
is uh, adding uh, some nations that are pointing away from so-called bad vertices. Uh, and uh, so what happens in this case is that we stay more time with the gradient thanks to these new directions. And here we have an example um, how the methods work. We have a point XK, we have this BK somehow chosen and as a, for some reason a bad vertex. What we do is uh, flipping the direction then point from XK to our BK. And what we get is this new direction that uh, allow us to clash to the boundary. And then what we get is uh, uh, quick convergence to the point X star. What we can prove in this case is a uh, linear convergence. Uh, this is what like Austin and Coder proved in the uh, 2015 paper. Uh, we can prove linear convergence uh, under suitable assumptions. And uh, you can also prove support identification in finite time, in finite time uh, for these uh, class of algorithms. We now focus on a specific, uh, specific uh, bug that uses uh, away steps. And uh, this is the Frank Wolf method with in phase direction that from now on we call FDFW. In this case, the away vertex BK is defined by simply maximizing the, the linearized objective uh, um, of the problem on the minimal F uh, XK. And the minimal phase of course contain, uh, contains XK. So what we want is to solve this new problem. Uh, so what we need in this case, uh, what the method, method requires is an efficient linear minimization oracle for the minimal phase. If we have two, uh, then uh, we can easily define uh, the FDFW direction as uh, the best direction between the Frank Wolf direction and the away step direction. It is, uh, as, uh, again, uh, as we said before, uh, it's the direction that points away from the bad, ver the bad vertex BK. Okay. And we choose between these two directions. Uh, by using this rule. So we the one with the best uh, scalar product with respect to the gradient calculated in XK. If we think about our uh, problem, uh, max X as the effective click problem, uh, the cost of uh, this um, oracle is um, that big. In fact, if you consider if you consider f equal to minus hg and omega equal to ps, it's easy to see that in the worst case scenario, um, this problem corresponds to find this as a smallest component in a vector um, that has a size at most equal uh, to the number of missing edges in our uh, graph. So what? Okay. Um, what is uh, nice in uh, this case is that uh, if we consider uh, these multiplier functions uh, for um, the um, we, uh, restrict our attention to the uh, simplex, we define the multiplier function related to the uh, non negativity constraints. We, uh, we consider, um, we calculate multipliers on x star, where x star is a stationary point, we have that these lambdas coincide with the Lagrange multipliers. And uh, what we can prove is a uh, result, that is uh, an active set identification on the probability simplex for the FDFW algorithm. And so if uh, we call a uh, star the um, set of um, uh, I, and the set of indices really to the multipliers that are zero at X star. Uh, what we can say is that there exists a ball and we have L1 ball uh, and uh, we uh, have a, an explicit formula for the radius of this ball. And once we are inside this ball, then we have, uh, uh, we can be sure that in a finite number of steps, we also have a bound in uh, this uh, number of steps. Uh, we can uh, make sure that the support of the point is going to be inside the set i x star, the extended support, and we still are 
inside the ball uh, at the end of this procedure. So uh, in case um, we strict complementarity holds, what we are basically saying is that uh, once we are inside the ball and find a number of steps, we uh, identify the support on the solution. And this is an important that can be also extended to general polytopes under suitable assumptions. And this is the result that we massively use in our, um, for analyzing an algorithm that we propose to, for this defective click. Before anyway switching to our algorithm, what we want to notice is that the classic uh, FDFW uh, um, used for solving this defective click uh, has uh, some nice uh, behavior and under suitable assumption, we can guarantee divergence to uh, strict uh, local maxima and we can uh, identify the support for K large enough. So we, the nice part is that we have uh, support in identification in a finite time for the, F, the, the FW. And, but the con is that the, the block of variables X and Y are tied up together um, because we need to use the same step size at each iteration for uh, both blocks. And what happens is then is that when large uh, bit are used, we have a poor quality of the solution. And when small bit is used, we have really slow convergence due to the way we update the Y and this is the reason why we try to explore the structure to get a better uh, approach and, and um, allow us to uh, independently update the, the X and Ys. So as we will see, what we can do is performing an FDFW step on the axis, a uh, full tranquil step on the Y. So uh, splitting up in two parts, the optimization process. And this is uh, the algorithm we propose, uh, the uh, Frank Wolf uh, for its defective click that we call FWDC. So as you can easily see, um, this is basically a kind of Frank Wolf, uh, uh, a block coordinate approach where uh, for the first block, uh, the X uh, related to X variables, we use uh, uh, one internet of uh, FDFW and the other case, we perform a full, uh, a full Frank Wolf step with respect to the Ys. Uh, and what we, of course, do is updating the gradient. So it's a kind of uh, um, sequential uh, updating scheme uh, for uh, uh, the variables. In this case, what we can prove is that the Y is ultimately constant, and we have a bound on the number of uh, times Y changes. And we can easily prove convergence properties uh, by exploiting this fact. What we actually have case is uh, an explicit bound uh, for the active set radius uh, the same way we had for the uh, uh, probability simple case uh, we have seen before. This is very nice because the bound actually depends on the main features of our uh, graph. We also tested the method uh, on uh, some instances from the second DMAX implementation challenge and we compared uh, our method FDFW uh, and conopt over the regularized problem. And we also compared these three approaches with the um, approach proposed in the paper by Stoshkov and co authors, uh, where they combine conopt with a post processing routine, uh, routine for the non regularized problem. And of course, we use 100 restarts uh, for each uh, instance. And here we can see how the method, uh, methods perform with respect to the normalized max click found. And here is uh, how the method performs, uh, the methods perform with respect to the CPU time. So what we can surely say is that uh, uh, the proposed method uh, is uh, robust in terms of uh, uh, max uh, uh, DS, the effective click file. And uh, of course, guarantees uh, much better performances in terms of uh, CPU time. So uh, to conclude, we use a regularized continuous uh, formulation for the maximum mass defective click problem. And we also developed a, a Taylor Frank Wolf variant handle, efficiently handle this problem. And if uh, Taylor, the variant that has some nice theoretical uh, properties. And what we have also experienced is that uh, from a computational point of view, the proposed Frank Wolf uh, method is both efficient and reliable.
about future works, uh, we need to extend the approach to other click relaxations, and we would like to analyze framework variance uh, for uh, product domains. This is what we uh, plan we plan to do. Here are some references related to uh, the this talk, in particular. Uh, these results uh, show that uh, and be uh, are included in this sign uh, Simon's paper that is going to be um, is going to appear very soon. And uh, one the results related to active set complexity are in this psyoped paper. While uh, some the related to Frank Wolf, Frank Wolf methods are included in this uh, survey that we recently published on, on for a while. And we also have some other nice uh, references uh, we used uh, in this talk. So thanks uh, for uh, your attention and sorry for being a bit late. I know no, that's perfect. <laughs> Thank you very much. I tried to rush a bit. Yeah, timing I hope. was great. <laughs> uh, was thanks cool. Francesco. Um, so we, we have time for some questions. I would have one at least, uh, if you if you allow me to start. So yes. thank, thanks, Francesco, for this uh, very nice talk. Um, I would have two questions, actually. Uh, so yeah. one is concerning a regularization strategy. So intuitively, it's somehow clear to me that you would like to have a convex regularized or something like an L2 norm because you would like to have a dense, you would like to identify a dense graph, right? So yeah. you don't want to have something sparsity promoting, but the contrary, actually. Yeah. But do you is there a possibility if you if you change the L two norm to an LP norm where P is bigger than two that you see something in the complexity maybe of the algorithm as well that this LP norm maybe gives you some insight and then maybe you identify that an optimal P or there's a trade off maybe somehow appearing. Well, this is um, surely an interesting point. We actually think about it. We. Um, we just uh, consider this uh, a two norm, but it's definitely something we should think about it. Uh, actually, also um, another option would be thinking about some completely way of uh, um, handling the Y, maybe some other uh, kind of regular that can, could be used. Mm. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of freedom here in principle. Yeah. You assume in a moment you penalize X and Y in the same way, with an L2 norm, but yeah. in principle you could vary this. And it, I don't know, maybe it doesn't help anything. That could also be. But yeah, could, I mean, it's clear problem... that you would like to have a dense graph, right? So the more convexity you have there, maybe the better, even for some aspects yeah. of the optimization. Yes. Some, uh, some extent, this is what we need to have. Uh, but I mean, reason why we also chose this kind of regularizer is that you keep uh, the structure I'm sorry, of the function. Nice. Matthias, so, so sorry that interrupt. This is, uh, we are maximizing, Matthias. Yes, so yeah, basically, it's an anti regular, ah. already forcing non density. Yeah. <clears throat> so F HG or FG is not con neither convex nor concave. Yeah. But we are maximizing. Yes, and we are we maximizing know that the function. A FG is basically concave on the on the minimal phase, as Francesco very well told us. But but this is a local property. So and this is basically after we have obtained then, sparsity or not sparsity, not before. So so I think this should be. It looks okay. like an uh, elastic net, but it is not. It's actually maximized. But even if you maximize, even then changing the, the parameters could also be interesting because then you change also the curvature towards the edges. No, 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 your question is valid. Sorry, I just, yeah. just want to clarify that yeah, yeah. this is not an, a, a sure. sparsity regularizer. Yeah, yeah, no, I understood that. I understood that. Yes, yes, great, great. Uh, okay, and maybe if you allow me a second question, but I think I see Cora also in the room, so maybe take Cora's question, and then if there's time left, we'd have yeah. another question. Yeah, okay. <laughs> It's okay. Well, it's okay. I mean, I mean, my my question was actually similar on the regularization. I was wondering, but um, I wanted to ask you, how do you choose your alpha and betas? Because mm. this will, you know, this is in the end like the crucial thing. Yes, for yes. Uh, uh, um, of course, um, it's not a piece of cake choosing alpha and beta. What 
I mean, what we did in, the, at least in the experiments, mm -hmm. was choosing uh, alpha equal um, to one and um, beta was equal to two divided by n to the square. And this uh, somehow and guarantees that you, in case you have, um, uh, for example, um, um, uh, characteristic vector for your for a click C and for some reason uh, you still uh, do not have uh, as defective click C that you have and you still do not have uh, uh, the right vector Y and so you need to set to one uh, one of the components of uh, Y uh, that are needed to build up the extended graph then uh, this value will uh, guarantee some I'd say I mean, from an intuitive point of view, uh, would guarantee that you for sure you'll choose once you uh, minimize with respect to the Y, you will choose uh, to fix to one uh, that component rather than so, so, component. so if I understood correctly, so beta can be small. So kind of beta my question can be is, uh, yes, yes. So actually, you just need a tiny bit, right? You just yes, need uh, the actually, question is kind of like the, how much do you need, right? You need a kind of a tiny bit that's yes, uh, yes. That would be enough to get the job done, actually. And um, okay, it uh, really guarantees very good result uh, in the end. Uh, yeah, I just I uh, my other th question was kind of just to understand the numerics a bit because sorry, yeah. I just I just uh, didn't see uh, very yeah. well. I mean, so yes. Uh, do you want to take a look at the? Uh, so the first is uh, related to the normal normalized. Like what uh, in this case, what we did was considering uh, the maximum as defective the x defective click that uh, the method uh, found yeah. uh, instance and um, uh, basically normalized with respect uh, to the best known click for the graph. So this is the reason why it's between uh, mm -hmm. I mean, is around one. Of course, yeah. you have some cases where it's a little bit bigger than one, but uh, more or less, this gives you an, an idea of how far you are from a, a good uh, click. Mm -hmm. okay. More or less, they are all around one uh, and they yeah. are not too much spread. Uh, I mean, these box plots then means that more or less the algorithms behave well enough, I would say. Well, from a computational point of view, I mean, from a CPU time point of view, you can easily tell, uh, easily see the difference uh, with respect to the other uh, approaches uh, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, we compared with. I mean, uh, it really makes a difference uh, to split up the optimization with respect to the two blocks. Uh -huh. Yeah, thank you very much. Very nice. I really like the application to networks. I think it's underexplored, you know, this area from an yes. optimization point of view. I mean, current network kind of research, you know, with your having a efficient optimization for it. I know that yeah. they they are, I mean, I have colleagues in networks that are very much would like more approaches, agree. so it's great. I think I, it's I completely great. agree. I mean, there is a lot of improvements and actually there is a lot of nonlinear optimization. Uh, yeah, uh, very nice. Going on in this uh, area, so I mean, great themselves uh, to be started in that. So, great, thank you very much for a very nice talk, uh, Francesco. Sorry to monopolize too much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, we have time for one last question. Uh, uh, there's a raised hand by Luis Felipe. Hi, uh, thank you for the for the talk, Francesco. It's just a, a very uh, basic question. I was just wondering uh, why not to do trust regions when making the Frank Wolf uh, method. It's a basic question, not for the application, but Sorry, in I general. I don't understand. When, uh, when you... why, why not to, to make a, a trust region strategy on the Frank Wolf uh, method? Because it's a linear model. So if omega is very large, you can have very large. Uh, direction so so what do what, what, what would you like to use the region approach uh, i do not understand it was uh, by minimizing uh, the the linear model you can add a trust region uh, and why not to do this just a curiosity and why 
but, but in this case, you would destroy the structure of uh, the of the problem. So you, the main reason why, and uh, this kind of approaches are uh, uh, so I mean, they are why this is that they are projection free, and uh, uh, so if you have a, a specific oracle that allows you to minimize. The, the original feasible set uh, omega. Uh, when you add up another constraint, you might you might destroy the structure, and so that you might not be able to use your uh, minimization oracle anymore. So, in principle, this is the reason why. Uh, if, I, I, um, if, sure. if you use the the L infinity norm, the the the, I think that you have the same structure. But okay, it's just but, but, but just but a many more but that's a real yes, but you, you are adding up a lot vertices. of uh, complexity in the structure. Yeah. I mean, uh, and if you choose a step size, for instance, you can you can if you would like to have it, you can you can more or less force your iterates to be within such an L infinity ball anyhow. Yeah. So it's not, yes. there's no point also, imposing it. Also, here. Uh, uh, point of view, yes. But uh, okay. if, if I may just, uh, do, I think the major obstacle of a generic L infinity trust region method is that the number of extreme points is too large for the L infinity ball. So uh, if we could discuss L1 trust region, but then I'm pretty sure that even this is much larger than this uh, effective LMO for, this, for the few vertices. And in the Thank variant, you. if I understood, uh, I think this was clear. No, in the variant, we even decrease the number of vertices because we are focusing on a subface for the LMO. Okay. Thank you very much for the sake of time. We're going to close the discussion, and uh, we're going to. Uh, well, I'll, I would like to thank uh, Francesco again for thank you. Uh, nice and, Thank you. Thanks to all the attendees. Yeah, thank you for being here. And we're